In this problem, we have a spherically symmetric charge distribution, and we're trying to find the electric field. So we can use Gauss's law. This problem also has non-uniform charge density, which means we're going to have to integrate to find the charge inside our Gaussian surface. So our charge distribution is spherical, radius r, and the charge density is non-uniform, and it increases as you go closer to the center, which means there's much more charge closer to the center of the sphere than there is at its surface. So let's first find the electric field for R greater than R, so we're outside. That would be outside the charge distribution. So we draw our Gaussian surface out where we want the electric field, and we'll let the distance from the center to our Gaussian surface be small r. Now, in order to find the charge in, we need to actually find the total charge of the entire sphere. And since the charge density is not uniform, we write that rho is equal to a little bit of charge over a little bit of volume. And we need to divide that sphere into small volume elements. Now, to divide a sphere into small volume elements, we use spherical shells. So the spherical shell has a thickness dr, a radius r. It doesn't matter if you go to the edge or the center because it's so thin. And the volume of that shell, so it's like a Christmas tree ball. The volume of a Christmas tree ball would be the surface area of the ball, 4 pi r squared, times the thickness dr. So that's the volume element that we use in our expression for rho. 4 pi r squared dr. Now to get the charge, the total charge inside that sphere, we solve this for dq. dq then equals rho times 4 pi r squared dr. Integrate both sides. And the integral of dq is just q total. And we have to integrate rho times 4 pi r squared dr. So that's the integral that you use every time you have a non-uniform charge density and a spherical charge distribution. Now, the limits of integration, in this case, even though we want the field outside the sphere, we have to stop at the edge of the sphere, capital R, because there's no charge past that point. So, substituting in for rho, rho is equal to 5 over r. So we have 5 over r times 4 pi r squared dr. Let's take 20 pi out of that integral, and we're left with r dr from 0 to the radius of the sphere, which just gives 20 pi times r squared over 2, or 10 pi r squared. So that's the total charge on that sphere. Now we can apply Gauss's law. Gauss's law says the electric field is equal to the charge inside the Gaussian surface over the area of the Gaussian surface times epsilon naught. So in this case, it's the total charge. The surface area of the Gaussian surface always depends on little r epsilon naught. So if you want to simplify that a little bit, 5 halves r squared over epsilon naught r squared. And that's the field for r greater than r. And you can see it does act like a point charge. Even though the total charge is 10 pi r squared, that's a constant. And this field drops off as 1 over r squared, just like a point charge. OK, part b, we're going to go inside the sphere. So now we draw our Gaussian surface inside the sphere. In here. We let the radius of the Gaussian surface be small r. Now we need to find q in, and q in is just the part inside this Gaussian surface. It's less than the total charge. We go back to our integral, and it's exactly the same integral. q in now would be the integral of rho times 4 pi r squared dr. But now our limits of integration are the Gaussian surface from 0 to small r, not the edge of the sphere. So subbing in for rho, same thing, 5 over r, still have 4 pi r squared. And we end up doing the integral of 20 pi r dr. 
but now it's from zero to small r, not capital R. And so Q in becomes 20 pi small r squared over 2 or 10 pi small r squared. So the amount of charge inside depends on where that Gaussian surface is inside, which makes sense. If I take my Gaussian surface right to the edge to r equals capital R, I get the same thing as I had before with the total charge. So Gauss's law, Q in over A epsilon naught. And now I have the variable R squared on top. I also have the variable R squared on the bottom. And it turns out this electric field is a constant. 5 halves over epsilon naught. That's for R less than R. So because that charge density is changing and the volume changes inside, it actually turns out to be a constant electric field. So if I were to graph this electric field as a function of R, I would find it's constant when I'm inside. When I get to the edge, it then decreases as 1 over R squared, just like a point charge. And this constant is 5 over 2 epsilon. Well, not to the minus one.